Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today, we have a set of fun and exciting conversations and discussions regarding how AI will be shaping the future of retail. I am super excited to be here and thrilled to be joined by a group of fantastic speakers across the industry. Um, I'd like to welcome to join me uh, Shish Sridhar, who is the retail lead at uh, Microsoft, Richard Newman, who's the chief revenue officer at Acumera, Naren Kumar, who is the retail business lead at Intel, and I am Yunus Amar, VP of product at Waller AI. I'd like to welcome our speakers and panelists to wave their hands to the audience. Good morning. They're here. Good They're morning, everyone. Well. Okay. So just like I said, I am super excited to be here. And um, I'm, I'm super uh, thrilled to hear from our panelists and hear their insights. Before we get started, we'd like to pull our audience and also learn who do we have today. So we have a couple of questions that will be uh, coming on your screen. The first one is, are you a retailer or working on retail related initiatives? Looks like we have a good diverse group here. And then we have another question regarding your AI journey. Today, how far along are you in your AI journey? Meaning you have models in production already. Are you, plan to, are you planning to have models in production in the next six months or maybe the next year? Or uh, you can totally say it's not a priority right now. Some good results already in production, planned for next year. Give it a few more minutes. Or a few more seconds. Great. All right, so we have some interesting answers. Uh, good audience today. And uh, I am super excited to actually yield the floor to uh, our first presenter, Shish, who will be sharing his perspective and insights on how AI can transform retail. Uh, Shish, as I mentioned, is a global retail lead at Microsoft, so he has a lot of insights to offer today. So with that, Shish, I'm going to yield the floor to you, and you can go ahead and uh, share your insights with us. Take it away. Super. Thank you, Yunus. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Shish. And as Yunus mentioned, I'm the global lead for retail within Microsoft for startups. Um, on the slide, you can see uh, the QR code for my LinkedIn if you need to reach out. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about what I do and also my perspectives in AI before we actually jump into the, to the panel. Uh, next slide, please. So to really talk about what I do and how I interact with uh, retailers, with AI, startups, all of that, a little picture that talks about how Microsoft works with startups. So overall, there is multiple teams within Microsoft that works with startups in different ways. Uh, one of them is M12, and you can see that on the slide, at the center of the slide, which is really the VC arm of Microsoft, where a lot of the investments come through M12. There's a couple of hundred startups in that group. In addition to that, there is an accelerator, Microsoft for Startups, and that's really where I sit. And um, you can see at the bottom of the slide, there is something called Founders Hub, and this is a something where all startups are welcome. We essentially help startups with everything from, you know, credits for Azure, support, mentorship, uh, access to all of the software for internal use, you know, publishing the solution on the marketplace so that it's discoverable and accessible and all of that. 
all these things that enable startups to grow and scale. Uh, in Founders Hub, and this is really, it's open to every startup, right from ideation, MVP to product market fit. We have over 70,000 startups in that group. Um, and then at, at a certain point, past PMF, we accelerate the go-to-market. We connect the startups with real-world prog- problems by connecting them with retailers. In my case, retailers. I work with retailers as well as startups. So if you look at the PMF, there is a program called Pegasus, and that's really where I sit. And I drive the post-PMF uh, startups, connect them with retailers. So the Pegasus program is also open to retailers. So if you're a retailer listening to this, feel free to reach out to me to join the Pegasus program, to be able to connect with interesting startups, join some of our roundtables and so on. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that's obviously happening in the startup world is the acceleration of AI. And Gen AI, as you all know, uh, December 2022 was sort of a tipping point when ChatGPT was released. Uh, uh, GPT and Gen AI has been around primarily in white papers and academic work, and then it became more commercialized at that point. And the acceleration of you know adoption by enterprises, startups has been unprecedented. The pace of innovation has been uh, very fast over the last few months. The number of deployments we're seeing of Gen AI and AI-based capabilities is extremely high. Uh, this quote is something that reflects what is happening in the startup world, as well as the enterprise world. In the startup world, what I'm seeing is many of the startups that I was working with that built line of business applications are really adding the, the capabilities to their existing applications to enhance it, or they're building completely new capabilities based on what is possible with AI and Gen AI. And that's something we're seeing, the pace at which we're seeing this is absolutely unprecedented. We're seeing a lot of startups in the space. Next slide, please. So here again, uh, one of the things that's interesting is what are the areas that we're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of the innovation from AI, Gen AI based startups. And a lot of the, this chart really illustrates some of those capabilities that includes, you know, the infrastructure innovation that is happening, the GPUs, the storage network capabilities, optimizing all of these. Uh, and some of the panel on the panel today, for example, Intel is doing a lot of innovation in that space. Uh, and the next level, we're also seeing a lot of startups building foundational models. So we are, for example, working with OpenAI, with Mistral and the Llama models and all of those. Uh, we're seeing domain specific models as well for retail. I'm seeing that in grocery, for instance. I'm seeing that in fashion, where very specific domain models being created and model hubs. Uh, another area that uh, from a innovation perspective, there's plenty of startups in our portfolio that that you know cover that next layer of ai tooling prompt engineering vector dvs fine tuning model deployment and so on um, and optimizing these processes and this is where uh Walleroo, who's also on the panel and is organizing this is is part of that layer above that we're seeing applications so there is another host of uh, startups uh, in my case, because I focus on retail, I'm seeing a lot of retail specific use cases in Gen AI and AI based startups in that space. Again, if you're a retailer, feel free to reach out if you want a list of all these startups uh, and to, to look at and work with. Uh, I'm happy to share those as well. Next slide, please. And I'd like to close up with some of the trends that I'm seeing in AI and uh, Gen AI. Um, some of the ones that uh, stand, out, stand out would be really the hyper-personalization, where today, because of Gen AI capabilities, we're seeing things like product descriptions. Many of the retailers are looking at how can I make those product descriptions speak to the audience? Uh, really make it very, very personalized based on the knowledge we have about 
the shopper. And that's really where Gen AI stands out. How do we hyper-personalize the imagery of the products based on season, based on the likes of the shopper and so on? How do we hyper-personalize it based on region and season and all of those kind of things? So the use cases there are, are increasing and also the number of startups that we're seeing that are creating these image generation, text generation, uh, personalized marketing, those are areas that I'm seeing a lot of startups uh, show up in. And the second one, which I think is a big trend for this area, really for this year, really is the small language models. Uh, last year, the focus was on large language models, but this year, uh, a couple of things that is uh, standing out for me is the shift to small language models, uh, mainly because of things like performance, the compute requirements, uh, and, and also security and so on. And a lot of companies are working with these small language models, and you probably saw the announcements two days ago in Pi 3. Uh, there's Llama 2, there is Mistral, uh, and all of these small language models being fine-tuned and trained for domain-specific use cases for everything about food and nutrition and diet or everything about fashion and apparel and so on. And these use cases are standing out this year. Uh, the other one that I'm also excited about that I'm seeing a lot of uh, startups work, work on is the multi-agent orchestration. Create specialized agents that can talk to each other and have these orchestration layer. Uh, Microsoft, for example, released a product, uh, it is on GitHub called AutoGem that enables these orchestration of agents um, and scenarios around this where uh, small language models and agents are working with each other. Uh, each of them has a specialized knowledge about something and that the workflows get orchestrated uh, for line of business scenarios. That is again standing out as, as a innovation this year. We're going to see a lot of solutions come out here as well. And of course, multimodal models, and that's again uh, scenarios where a combination of videos and images and, and text uh, working together. And that's again another scenario that we are seeing a lot of startups working on this year. The final one that I put in here is really um, seeing a lot of the legacy startups integrate AI capabilities and Gen AI capabilities to add new capabilities or enhance the existing capabilities. And that's, again, another trend that I'm seeing in the Gen AI and AI space when I look at it from the lens of, of startups. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Eunice. Thank you, Shish. This was super insightful. I have a, a question for you, actually, before uh, we move on to the next presentation. How can retailers leverage AI today to create a unique and personalized consumer experience? Um, and consequently, how can they keep themselves differentiated from the, the competition without trying to follow some recipe that may not be appropriate for them? So one of the things I think uh, from a retailer perspective is really to look at what are the tasks that are taking significant resources and time. Uh, when I look at all of the, you know, the hundreds of use cases that, that, and case studies that were published over the, the last year, I'm kind of looking at, you know, one, uh, retailers can kind of see there are certain tasks that are better done with AI models. They're, they're not tasks that require you know, emotional IQ or tasks that don't require, I would say, empathy or customer engagement. Uh, a typical one would be, you know, identifying those tasks uh, like product descriptions. Stitch Fix, for example, published an article where they said, you know, they, was, they used to spend hours and hours creating these product descriptions, writing it out, and weeks later they would have their catalog. And some of those product descriptions were not very interesting either. You know, how do you describe a white t-shirt? Uh, what do you put in that product description? That was a huge challenge. Now, taking things like that and trying to automate that, uh, saying let's let's be creative, let's create a, you know product descriptions that are dynamic, that are changing based on on context, changing based on season, changing based on you know what's going on right now. Uh, can we automate that at scale? And those are kind of 
thinks that uh, many retailers should be identifying. What are those tasks uh, that are repetitive, that are generally fairly boring, that we can then automate? And, and, and I'm gonna, probably going to repeat this one a lot of times. Uh, the big concern that retailers have and, trying to, and, and people in general have is AI going to replace my job? Uh, and one way for retailers to look at this is to say, it's not replacing your job, but replacing tasks. So break it down and say, what part of your job you could do without? Or what part of your job, a, a particular person in retail, their job, it could get better. Focus on the areas where creativity and, and empathy and all of those are required. Make that a bigger part of, of, of people's jobs and then reduce the repetitive boring ones. So product descriptions, creating imagery, all of those are areas where retailers are saying we can replace that or we can, we can become more efficient. That's sort of a quick win uh, to speed up things and, and become more competitive in a way. Super. That, that's super insightful. Thank you so much. And I also would like to invite our audience to post questions in the, uh, in the question section of the webinar. So keep the questions coming, everyone. Thanks, Shish. Thank you. All right. Now I would like to invite Richard, um, who is the Chief Revenue Officer at Acumera, to share his insights with us and his, uh, everything that he learned from the field. Take it away, Richard. Thank you, Yunus. It's great to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Acumera, what we do in retail, and how AI is really um, both transforming the world that we, you know, sort of live in, um, and as well as what some of the opportunities and challenges are uh, along the way. So let's go to the next slide. So just um, so quickly about us, we're we're a business that's entirely focused on retail and hospitality, and you know. Uh, for us, whether it's a store or a restaurant, uh, there's a lot of commonality between the two. And um, our, our solutions, which include um, edge computing and secure edge networking, apply to both. Um, these are products that you know we deliver uh, directly and create as our proprietary technology. And the reason um, you know we're excited about this webinar is because um, we're seeing a huge increase uh, in application and the expectation for even more around AI and ML-based applications. So uh, today we're in more than 50,000 locations. Uh, we've got real world use cases of AI being deployed right now uh, in both retail uh, and hospitality. Uh, the use cases can be very, very different. Um, the, the technologies associated with it can be very, very different. In, in some cases, it's generative content uh, that's being delivered uh, to consumers. In other cases, it's ML uh, being used you know, for data analysis uh, and insights. Um, in some cases, those can be video-based. In other cases, uh, it can be speech-based. Um, and I want to get into uh, some of the details about, you know, how you need, um, you know, to build a technology foundation, which includes solutions um, like strong edge computing platforms, great networking, good security, um, and technology helps you manage uh, the underlying, you know, uh, application layers associated with AI and ML, like Wallaroo. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, at its foundation, you have to be able to deliver your applications. Um, we, t we provide two platforms, um, which are uh, generic and agnostic relative to the underlying applications they provide. And the reason we feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly important to have an approach that allows you to deliver and manage these applications that's agnostic to the applications is because uh, the last thing retail uh, or uh, the hospitality industry needs is more standalone systems. So when you see some of the use cases around AI and ML that some of the other speakers are going to talk about, uh, let's say it's vision technology that's being used to analyze, um, you know, um, product use uh, or customer consumer interaction of products uh, within a retail store through through video. Um, dropping a dedicated box to do that adds another piece of complexity. Um, these applications, you know. Are, are really very tightly integrated with cloud. And that's another thing you'll see quite commonly. Um, and the way you manage and deliver those applications should be in line with how you deliver and manage applications within your cloud-based infrastructure. Uh, and along the way, there's the need to be able to support the legacy components. And Shish mentioned that because, you know, we, we all live in a world where we can't snap our fingers and change the underlying technology which makes our stores and restaurants uh, operate. So 
Um, if you're a retailer, uh, you can't wish that your point of sale system would go away uh, and replace it all with just walkout technology. That's not realistic. It's the kind of disruption I don't think would be good for your business or your customers. Uh, and while some of the just walkout technologies leverage uh, AI and ML quite extensively, um, it's an entirely new, uh, you know, sort of store type for most retailers. Um, the 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 you know sort of more direct way to get there is to take the existing legacy-based infrastructure, traditional point of sale, and complement and enhance it with you know with AI and ML to make those shopping experiences better. Um, and from that standpoint, um, what we look at when we look at a customer that's on their journey to the implementation uh, of, of AI and ML-based applications is what do they have today? How can AI and ML integrate with that? And how can you provide a platform uh, to them which allows you to operate your existing uh, infrastructure and support the new next generation applications concurrently? Uh, let's jump to the next slide, please. So from that standpoint, um, we are a huge proponent of the idea of a traditional edge computing infrastructure. So that's kind of a little bit of an oxymoronic statement, traditional edge, um, because really edge represents something quite new. Um, but in our view, um, if you're doing AI and if you're going to do it within the physical four walls of a store, so we're not talking about um, the use of AI and ML in the cloud uh, entirely to support you know, some level of retail uh, operations. We're talking about uh, using AI and ML in the store location. It's not to say that cloud-based implementations, there's anything wrong with them. There's plenty of great new customer experiences you'll be able to bring by deploying um, that, you know, uh, AI and ML in the cloud. But um, when you're affecting the operations within the physical store location, so let's say it's vision enhanced checkout. There's a bunch of solutions that do that today. And vision enhanced checkout, um, particularly for self-checkout, can be hugely beneficial. It can allow product identification to occur, you know, um, with greater accuracy than just scanning a barcode. Um, it can provide and really important. We've seen a lot of implementations of, of ML uh, used in loss prevention associated with checkout, traditional checkout and self-checkout. Um, and we're seeing, you know, um, one initiative that we've been part of, which has been hugely successful, is the ability to enable um, conversational AI uh, to be used within uh, the four walls of the store or restaurant. And two good examples of that are um, several of our customers right now are deploying um, AI at their drive through location. So uh, they can, a customer can interact um, uh, with, uh, you know, a machine learning algorithm to take their orders. And this is hugely productive. Uh, it means you're not dedicating a human being to that interaction. Um, and ML can provide insights that humans don't necessarily do in the ordering process. So it's both a better, it can be both be a better experience for the consumer um, and it can be a, you know, a huge productivity increase if you've got uh, a, you know, a consumer that's interacting via voice, um, whether it's a drive through or some other location within the store. Um, we've got another uh, customer that's been piloting uh, the same kind of idea of conversational AI at the kiosk level to provide additional insight. You know, one of the, again, driving this use case, you know, has to do with the rising cost of labor within stores. Uh, and restaurants, for example, and the ability to have, you know, as many, you know, conversational AI, um, you know, interactions uh, as you want, as opposed to limiting them to what a person can deliver. But at the end of the day, what makes what what help, what makes those applications actually run? Um, so in the older world, what you're talking about is the deployment of another phys dedicated physical system. Um, but the truth is, and we'll get to this in the next slide in a second, is that deploying them on edge has huge advantages and you know, we're of the mind that um, edge computing is going to be the dominant way applications are going to be delivered and managed uh, within the physical premises over the next couple of years. It's one of those great tipping points, the same way uh, we went from mini and mainframe computers back a couple decades ago um, to much smaller microprocessor based systems, which really caused an explosion of innovation to take place um, within electronic commerce within the, within the physical store. What's driving this next generation of innovation, the applications, the AI and ML-based applications, combined with edge computing to deliver and manage them is, is the game changer. So let's go to the next slide. So why does AI need edge? So as I just you know sort of mentioned, it's kind of foundational for in-store retail AI. You, you, if you're going to run a model, um, if you're going to drive sensors that are going to collect data that a model is going to interact with, if you're going to integrate anything your models are doing, whether it's generative, whether it's small, 
um, you know, whether it's for data analysis or decision making, it's going to have to run somewhere. And if you're, you know, you can run a good amount of these things in the cloud, but quick decision making or the processing of large amounts of data and then running a model against it needs to take place on prem. And if it's taking place on prem, you, your choices of running it are in, you know, a more traditional sort of dedicated, um, you know, client server based infrastructure or a newer, more modern approach, which would be edge computing based. Um, and then edge computing unleashes a tremendous amount of opportunity. It gives you the ability, for example, to, to manage um, applications as Docker container based workloads. So in the cloud, of course, we're very used to seeing um, AI and ML applications uh, expressed as, as Docker uh, using large orchestration solutions like Kubernetes, um, the ability to auto scale those applications again in the cloud, the ability to pair uh, the compute infrastructure that you might need, whether that's a CPU or GPU, um, to the, the underlying application. If you want to have the same analog to that uh, running within the four walls of a store, uh, it's going to be edge computing based. It could be standalone dedicated edge computing systems, or it could be edge computing systems that operate as part of a cluster. Um, and what that, the benefit that brings obviously immediately is the fact that single purpose servers are costly to operate and difficult to integrate. Uh, we have, and we've seen really interesting uh, AI and ML use cases hit a wall um, because while there were clear business benefits for them, they weren't able to overcome um, what was a required bar on uh, you know, total cost of ownership um, and ROI. Uh, in other words, if you have an AI and ML application that can generate, uh, let's say, $1,000 uh, of additional sales in a given month, um, if it requires $25,000 of additional hardware to do it uh, in a single store location, and you're looking at a two year plus uh, return on investment, it might not fly for implementation right now. So the question is, can I take that investment that I may have to make um, on you know, specific infrastructure, software and hardware, and I can, can I get that down from the multiple thousands of dollars into the multiple hundreds of dollars and see a, a real return? Um, the answer is gonna be, let's do it, as opposed to, I'm not so sure. Uh, and there's been a lot, of, a lot of the folks on this call, a lot of our customers, um, have hit this wall. They, they, they're attracted, they're excited about the opportunities that some of the new uh, AI and ML applications bring, but they have to find a way to be able to make it manageable, supportable, operatable at scale. And again, a good edge computing infrastructure um, provides that. Uh, we're one of, of, a, of a bunch of organizations that do it. We have to think ours is the best. Um, but when you start thinking about your, from an application standpoint, you know, what am I going to be implementing? How is this going to work? Uh, chances are you're going to arrive at the, just at the conclusion that, well, we need an edge computing infrastructure to do it. Um, and to, to, to wrap things up and give time to the other speakers, I'll just touch on a couple more things. Um, uh, the one that's very important is having an open hardware architecture, as, as I kind of just alluded to. Um, you're going to have your specific requirements around CPUs and GPUs, and you want to be able to pick the solution that's going to best give you uh, the right capabilities uh, and the right um, you know, at the right price point. And being open in terms of hardware is really important. Um, also, uh, we think any cloud connectivity is also a must when you're looking at this. Um, and that's not just because, you know, you may have a favorite cloud provider, like, you know, uh, uh, Shish coming out of Microsoft would be a huge fan of the Azure cloud, as are we. Um, but the applications you're looking to deploy and the vendors that might be delivering them might be geared towards another cloud. And you may want to have, you know, be able to support a multi-cloud infrastructure. So you'll want to be able to have that in place too. Um, and the last thing I'll just touch on uh, really quickly is don't leave out security. Um, you need, the AI and ML applications require uh, rethinking um, how uh, cybersecurity is delivered within the four walls of the store. And you need to have an agile comprehensive model that provides a defense in depth. Edge computing can deliver that because you can, have, you can deploy a set of containers, for example, that are core to a specific um, AI ML application, but add another couple containers in that provide secure, specific security controls that are from another vendor tire, entirely unrelated to that AI and ML application, but provide the defense in depth you need. So with that, I think that's all for my slides. I'll, I'll turn this back over uh, to Yunus um, for the next speaker. Thank you, Richard. Uh, this was super um, interesting and fascinating. There is a, uh, a topic that you brought up around network and connectivity, which is a, uh, a concern when it comes to deploying edge uh, or AI at the edge. 
Uh, I'd like to actually get your perspective on on network and being a concern, but at the same time, this is also a, a poll question for the uh, the audience, so it's going to be a fun A/B test here to uh, to, to try. But uh, yeah, I'd like to hear uh, what are the the concerns from your perspective, if it's security, reliability, complexity, yeah. uh, compliance, uh, integrations. Sure, absolutely. So a, a lot of, you know, when AI and ML applications are developed, they're often done sort of cloud first. And the expectation is, is that there's unlimited bandwidth and unlimited resources, and the network is always there. Um, that does not translate to the real world. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we often have to live with the networks we have, not the networks we want. So the, when you're looking at your infrastructure and you're looking at the applications you want to deploy, um, you need to make sure they're not going to work only in the best case scenarios, but really in all scenarios. And they have to be built in a way that accounts for the fact that connectivity, regardless of how much you spend, is not going to always be available. They have to be built in a way also that allows you to work um, with a reasonable expectation regarding what connectivity is going to cost. Uh, we don't have gigabit uh, networks going to every store location, and nor has 5G lived up to the expectations that some folks have had for it to be you know, hundreds of megabytes always available uh, all the time. It doesn't necessarily work like that. So uh, again, networking is going to be required. You're going to have requirements around cloud connectivity, but applications have to be built to be able to accommodate less than ideal conditions. Sounds good. And uh, the top answer we got here is reliability and scalability. So sounds, sounds uh, like a conclusive A-B test here. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we're about to transition to our next speaker here, Naren, who um, is going to share his uh, insights from the field. Uh, Naren is the retail business lead at Intel. Uh, please take it away, Naren. Thank you so much, Yunus. Thank you very much. Thank you, audience. Uh, it's a delight to be sharing our perspective here. I really enjoyed listening to our previous uh, speakers, Shish and, uh, from Microsoft and you know Richard from Acumero. Very, very insightful. Uh, Noreen Kumar, I'm with Intel Network and Edge Group. Um, my job as a retail business lead is really bringing digital transformation in the brick and mortars uh, and enabling that. That's really what I do. And let me uh, share our perspective at Intel, how we are approaching bringing AI into, into the retail space. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, this is just my perspective. Um, you know, uh, existing, I, I'm glad, you know, uh, Richard touched on this as well. It's not about replacing existing infrastructure, but how can we complement uh, the same? Uh, also want to echo the same thing as well. Today in existing infrastructures, you know, there are point of sales, mobile point of sales, self-checkouts, name it. And they're already running today in business critical applications. Um, and, you know, and some of them are Intel powered today because our customers trust the brand Intel and the value that it brings, the reliability it brings, the security that it brings. So for over decades, you know, we have been powering devices at the edge, as you see on the screen. And so again, I wanna say thank you. If you're a retailer, if you're using Intel inside, I wanna say thank you. And if you're a partner using Intel, thank you as well. This is the existing infrastructure but we want to bring AI to this existing into infrastructure, um, into your existing point of sale, into your existing self-checkout, or even autonomous uh, vending, and so on. That's our approach. That's the current thinking. Um, and we're enabling the ecosystem and deployments in that approach. And, and continue to deliver on the business goals, lowering total cost of ownership, improve better customer experience at the checkout, or in the middle of the aisle, how do we uh, improve customer experience? And bottom line is really increase, uh, help you increase your growth. And that's how we th we think about when you hear the term bringing AI anywhere, that's our thinking in point of sale, digital signage kiosk. And uh, I'll just unpack a little bit, how might that really manifest uh, in solutions and in the field? Uh, next slide, please. So really, um, I, I use the term device edge, on-prem edge, and cloud. Well, let me just walk you through here. Device edge to me translates to point of sale, kiosk, and self-checkout, and so on. You already have those solutions in your infrastructure. 
And our approach is, you know, can you run your AI model on the existing kiosk, self-checkout? And there's all the Intel processor in there. Can you, uh, you know, using our open VNO framework, convert your models and optimize for Intel, you can run your models on, on the existing infrastructure. And yes, you know, uh, is that meeting your needs from a performance standpoint, from a customer experience standpoint, um, and so on. And if you need additional boost, perhaps you could use the, you know, uh, starting with CPU, or integrated GPU, or you may use in a discrete GPU like Intel Arc, for instance. And again, the focus also is being at the edge. You know, uh, we feel like it's best economical to do inferencing type of workloads at the edge. Very similarly, on-prem uh, edge as well. Within the four walls of retail store, there's so many things happening. You know, there's devices, there's data. How do you process all the data at the edge? Going back to what Richard said, you know, is it is, is it economical, cheaper to run at the edge versus sending all the data to the cloud? So it's a balance. Uh, and should you choose an on-prem architecture, on-prem really really helps you with you know, can you do inferencing from all the video streams? Uh, from self-checkout type of, can you do uh, inferencing at the edge? So on-prem gives you that capability. You can run on CPUs, you can run you know, core CPUs or Xeon CPUs. Again, uh, converting a model with OpenVINO and optimized to run on Intel, Intel uh, platform. And then of course the cloud where we believe that, you know, for training, your model training and so on, it's, it's best to run on the cloud train your model on the cloud on Intel-based CPUs and then deploy them at the edge for inferencing. So that's just a view of how we think about uh, edge AI um, in, um, in the current deployment space. Um, next slide, please. And these are just some case studies where we have seen AI, the same mindset of deploying AI at the edge in cloud, um, and have done it for not one store, but multiple stores. And starting with Fitmatch, they really solve problems for body sizing. Um, if that has been an issue, what's the perfect size for me? So really they solve the body sizing issues and really giving a perfect fit for you as a consumer. Uh, they've deployed for various brands. It's the solution is powered by Intel, optimized by Intel OpenVINO. This solution is really helping, you know, forex conversion rates. When someone walks into the store, tries this uh, solution, you know, capability out, they really convert them into a potential buyer. A 20% increase in basket size, you know, 40% increase in uh, transactions, and overall 2x in loyalty. Again, FitMatch, they're all about uh, uh, solving size challenges and then reducing returns and so on. If that's your pain point, we should definitely talk. Similarly, C2RO, uh, our partner, they're about reducing shrinkage in the retail store. Their solution, which is again powered by Intel, open we know, uh, optimized. They deployed uh, their loss prevention solution across 2000 sites. As a result, they have deterred about 20, uh, 27 million events deterred. What could have been a, a, a loss, they have deterred that event. And uh, that translates to 81 million in recovered sales. And they have seen 12x for ROI for their customer. Again, this is C2RO. Another example of AI, how being practically used solving real world challenges for their customers. And lastly, AI powered self-checkout. Newman also touched on this. This is about how quickly can you transact um, uh, as part of your self-checkout and still have a great, amazing experience, right? And so this particular, you know, every game at the, uh, this self-checkout installed every game, there is 34% increase in transaction and every transaction is less than a minute, minute and still giving a great customer satisfaction. So this kind of gives you an idea of how currently AI has been deployed at a mass, at a scale level, and from an edge to cloud perspective. So next slide, please. And there's definitely, this is, we're just getting started with this topic of AI, 
And if you're really interested to know how AI can empower you as a retailer from automation, from uh, uh, innovation and so on, and how can it meet your needs, uh, I really encourage you to visit this uh, location, uh, website, uh, AI in Retail. Uh, we give you our ideas of how much you do things. And so um, with that, next slide, please. Yeah, so let me wrap it up with this slide. Uh, some people ask, you know, why is Intel in here too? You know, what's, what's Intel about? You know, really uh, two major comments from my side. We enable, we create world-changing technologies like compute, networking, connectivity, uh, and as well as, you know, cloud to edge. Cloud edge, how do we bring this infrastructure together? And sensing, and then of course, the big hot topic, AI. So we create these technologies. As a result, we also enable solutions um, uh, like open standard, Richard talked about, it is very important to us. You know, how do you consolidate, you know, the whole idea of do more with the same hardware, existing hardware, scalable. Uh, we are thinking from not just one store, but hundred stores, thousand stores. How can you scale your solutions across that? Secure, of course, you know, security is the heart of our enabling. And then lastly is the ecosystem. No matter where you are in this world, if you're looking for solution to be deployed in your store, I think we have an answer. We have an ecosystem partner who can do that. So again, we create world-changing technologies. We work with uh, partners to enable solutions. And with that, I wrap it up and thank you and I pass it on to Eunice. Thank you, Naren. This was super insightful. Uh, I have a question for you, if you don't mind, um, around the, uh, the, we keep hearing about autonomous stores and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the advantages of implementing those as well as the challenges that come with uh, uh, implementing autonomous stores, especially when we think about, you know, a, a thousand square foot uh, type of area. Absolutely, you know, it's a very timely topic, and there's also there's a lot of misunderstanding about autonomous stores. You know, uh, uh, but technology by itself is amazing. Uh, I think it's really intended to do what it's supposed to do: remove the friction in your shopping journey, in your checkout journey. And I think you know that's really doing from a technology perspective. But again, when you talk about realistically from a deployment standpoint, from a day-to-day -day maintenance standpoint, we need more than technology proven and so on. So from that perspective, what we have seen is, you know, I've been personally involved in installing some one particular uh, autonomous store as well, Intel powered. Uh, this particular retailer, they're like, hey, this technology is too new. Let me start small. Let me start in my own cafeteria for my employees before I roll out. Right to understand. So that's just one. And then there are other similar scenarios. Bottom line is we've seen that technology is there, but in order to deploy scalable, you have to figure out what's the right format, right? Uh, right format of the store. What's the SKU count and so on, because there's also the cost attribute behind it. And we've seen like 500 square feet, uh, less than 1,000 square feet have been more successful in more in the rollouts. Beyond that, it's still, you know, economics are not quite there, right? And so we've seen a lot, you know, in different parts of the world, uh, smaller store formats are working and a very specific like C store type and so on have been very successful, but larger format stores, we're not quite there yet. And stadiums and so on just makes sense, but other areas, economics is not adding up yet. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, and I think this is the last part of the uh, the presentation. Um, I, I would like to basically share Wallaroo's perspective on how we're enabling operationalizing AI at scale for retail uh, without any complexity. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing to share here with the audience, I'm not saying anything new, but the retail industry has been notorious for making data-driven decisions since the 80s. I was in diapers in the 80s, uh, but my elders actually, the ones I listen to have told me that this is an industry that has been notorious for that. Uh, so it's natural to think that this industry is ripe for AI. And the, the role of AI from our perspective at Wallower is that it's gonna come in to help accelerate 
data-driven decisions for retailers to differentiate themselves from their competitors. So um, as someone leading the, the product efforts here at Wallaroo, talking with our customers, some of the use cases that emerged in, this, um, in those conversations around um, are typically around elevating shopper experiences in store. Uh, this is essentially the self-checkout scenario, the autonomous stores. This is where edge AI plays a huge role in, uh, in, in those use cases. Um, and then uh, conversely, or, or on, the other, on the other side of the spectrum in cloud, um, everything related to mining and weaponizing or utilizing your data to actually create better online uh, shopping experiences, whether it's dynamic pricing and promotions or personalized marketing campaigns, or basically um, offering good product recommendations based on uh, more tailored consumer segmentation. And then to Shisha's point, the other um, use case we're seeing is now uh, elevating or upskilling store associates with, with data and AI to actually help um, upsell products in store or streamlining store operations and basically limiting some of the repetitive tasks that can happen in store, also even in the, uh, uh, in, in the back office when marketing content is being created. And then finally, supply chain is something that we should not discount when it comes to uh, what retailers focus on, with, especially with the, uh, the, the trade-offs between supply and demand, how, can you can, how you can actually and accurately forecast uh, product demand based on seasonality, based on uh, manufacturing, uh, constraints based on other constraints that will actually enable you to uh, get to to your consumers and deliver your your products uh, within the uh, the uh, projected timeline and expectations. Next slide, please. So when it comes to implementing um, AI enabled applications today, there are three components that we look at. Um, there's obviously the top layer, which is the the end goal and delivering the, uh, the AI-enabled applications. There is the, the bottom layer, which is your infrastructure. So uh, we, we heard from our partners today about what that infrastructure is. It's your edge computing stack, it's your cloud, it's your uh, 5G connectivity, it's your cameras, your hardware, your CPUs, your GPUs, all of that. And then there's the AI layer, which is basically the solution that will be implemented to basically uh, power that application that uh, or that end user facing application. That's where these AI solutions and AI models, data foundation, uh, as well as all the, uh, the uh, necessary AI management layers will, will be needed to essentially deliver these AI uh, applications at scale to create meaningful ROI for, for retailers. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the AI layer, particularly from, a, from Wallaroo's perspective, one thing I wanted to emphasize is really around uh, some of the challenges that come from uh, trying to go from infrastructure to uh, uh, AI-enabled applications. So today, when you look just at the AI layer, which is the, the new layer that is being introduced in, uh, um, uh, in, in the ecosystem, uh, you have essentially three, three steps that um, that, that are needed to go from essentially data to AI in production, creating value. Where uh, we see challenges when talking to our customers, but also doing some research, and according to Gartner, 90% of AI projects fail to deliver ROI in production. There are some challenges that are associated with that to basically uh, be able to create some meaningful value. And then when we start diving into those challenges, we go into, we basically identify three top challenges, which are in the next slide, please. So the, the, cha the challenges boil down to three areas in particular. Um, all the engineering that is required and specialized skills needed to oper operationalize models. Uh, complexity and cost, especially when it comes to inference workloads and infrastructure running in production. We talk about GPU scarcity when it com uh, comes to basically scaling and offloading uh, or ramping up, ramping down the, uh, the consumption of hardware resources. And finally, um, the, the, the third item is really when it comes to measuring ROI or proactively measuring ROI, lack of monitoring and troubleshooting is uh, definitely one of the, the challenges. And then with that and the, uh, essentially the, uh, the production costs and, uh, going up and the workloads that are right now uh, varying from computer vision to generative AI to edge AI, uh, there's certainly um, 
basically a need for a readable solution to ensure that regardless of, this, of the, uh, the type of workload that you want to run, the type of use case that you have, you're able to actually drive value for the business, despite where your data is, despite the, you know, the systems where that data might live, you, you become actually, you tend to want to become agnostic of those constraints. So you're basically delivering value to your end users and your, and your customers uh, without any, any of those challenges. Next slide, please. So when it comes to how Wallaroo is involved in solving those use cases, the name of the game for us is one word, is flexibility. At the end of the day, what we strive to do when working with our customers is really making sure that we give a, uh, a reliable and fully integrated, robust solution with our partners' help and, and their expertise as well to make sure that they can operationalize AI and, and their models at scale with, with the, the most, uh, with optimal efficiency or the most, with the least amount of overhead. Um, as a result, what we um, aim to offer is an industrial grade um, set of capabilities or solutions that basically reduce the risk of delivering your, uh, your AI models to production with the least amount of infrastructure uh, complexity and overhead. Uh, obviously, there is efficiency and uh, scalability that we uh, want to have on top of the hardware. That's where our technology and our infant server can, um, can be helpful there. And then finally, our model operations, including management and monitoring capabilities, ensure that you can uh, stay ahead of the game when it comes to how your models operate in production and how they can stay effective and reliable. And this, this is the end of my presentation. We have some resources here for you all to uh, check us out and reach out to us. And before we transition to a quick um, panel here and uh, some questions, uh, I'd like to ask a final poll question uh, to the audience. And it's a simple one. It's a yes or no question, maybe unsure. Um, do you believe that AI technology will improve the efficiency of retail operations based on what you heard today? I'm yet to see a no. I'm yet to see a not sure. Okay, 100% yes. Great. Looks like our presenters convinced our audience today. And it looks like one of my panelists today uh, might have a question. Sure, that was a very interesting presentation, Yanis. Um, and uh, one of the reasons, you know, why I'm excited about working with Waterloo was a challenge that I've been seeing in retail. Uh, it's something that you discussed with Noreen as well, where there is autonomous stores, and I'll kind of make it broader, you know, the digitization of the retail store. There is AI models being deployed for loss prevention, for traffic analysis, for shelf analytics, and for frictionless checkout. Uh, and typically this has been, you know, great what we've seen for that pilot flagship store uh, for a handful of stores, maybe, but then retailers have been struggling with, you know, how do you now take this and replicate it to 8,000 stores or 10,000 stores? Uh, curious about what the challenges are. And you talked about some of those, you know, how, do, how does a retailer address those, uh, the challenge of deploying and managing all these models? That's a very good question, and I would also like to hear Naren um, and Richard's perspectives on it. Uh, I'll start with mine. Uh, from my perspective and from Waller's perspective, it's really the, uh, the management layer associated with all those models and locations where they, where they go. It's one thing that you're able to actually get it to, to run in, in one location. It's another to actually uh, make sure that the packaging of that process is seamless so that you can uh, almost effortlessly uh, go from one to four stores to uh, actually thousand or thousand locations. Uh, we've seen that honestly in the cloud, but also now we're seeing it in, in the edge. It's, it's the, the same problem at the end of the day, which is management and observability of those models. Uh, if you build confidence and you're able to understand how the model is performing, and then you have a, an efficient way of 
proactively addressing those issues, then you have the essentially the the a way to to start going and deploying to many locations. That's really one of the 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 efforts where um, one of the main investments from a product perspective on on the Wallower side that we uh, have invested in uh, last year and this year to make sure that we're able to. Uh, uh, allow our customers and partners to scale these deployments with peace of mind at the end of the day and be able to make those updates and and manage uh, centrally or in a distributed way how these models are operating in uh, uh, in retail locations or in their stores. Thank you. Naren, I'd like, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think Eunice, well said. Uh, the only thing I would quickly add on to is uh, so also keeping in mind cost. You know, when you scale, cost shouldn't be exponential, right? Uh, that's another factor that I would add to it. And then, uh, but you really uh, summed it up pretty well. Richard, anything on your end? Yeah, I would. Uh, there's a lot to be said here. <laughs> I'll try to. I'll try to to summarize what I what you know, what I see is, you know, some of the, the biggest challenges in about 45 seconds or so. Um, but uh, for me, it's uh, a lot of it is about the fact that um, what looks like it will be highly successful in a very homogenous, you know, sort of cloud driven world. Uh, when you hit the when you hit the real world, the physical world, you're dealing with a lot of additional variability uh, in terms of everything from if you're if you're using AI to deal with sensors, the fact that different sensors in different locations act differently and pick up different different components. Um, it's to what you touched on already. It's about telemetry and observability of the models themselves and how they're performing. Um, and then the last thing is, is that the ability to actually uh, scale and operate these, um, these solutions in a cost-effective fashion. So my advice uh, to anyone looking at this is um, start with very small achievable goals with whatever you're looking to do. Um, and build from there. It's not, you cannot boil the ocean. This is the best analogy I've ever seen in all this is that um, billions of dollars have been spent trying to build fully autonomous self-driving vehicles, um, yet 99.9% .9 of the vehicles on the road today are not fully autonomous self-driving vehicles. Um, and similarly, whatever goals that you may have uh, with the application of AI or ML in your retail store location, um, if it involves a complete rethinking of how retail works, of the technology in your stores work, um, how your customers are going to interact with it, how your sales associates are going to behave, chances are you'll need to spend billions of dollars and need decades to be able to get that done. Well said. Thank you so much. And with that, we have about a few minutes late. Uh, this brings us to the end of our webinar. I just want to say thank you to all of our partners today, as well as the teams behind the scenes that helped organize this event. Uh, thank you so much. And I want to share some takeaways from today's presentations, listening to all the, the perspectives that we had from our panelists and presenters. Uh, really, uh, I have four that I gathered. Uh, the first one is that retail as a data-driven industry can benefit hugely from AI and accelerating and automating data-driven decisions, uh, basically to enhance in-store as well as online shopping experiences. Um, the other thing that uh, Shish touched on was around the flexibility when it comes to leveraging data to personalize these consumer experiences and trying to do something that is adaptable to your needs as a retailer, as an organization, without emulating uh, what um, uh, industry, other industry leaders are doing. And then things that uh, Naren and um, Richard touched on around uh, how retailers can leverage AI to quickly and efficiently adapt to changing behaviors and maintaining competitive advantages when it comes to launching uh, uh, autonomous stores or things like self-checkout um, and, and all those um, edge-enabled experiences that we're going to start seeing soon um, uh, uh, at scale. And then finally, uh, one thing that um, Shish mentioned initially going back to his perspective around retail professionals across the entire value chain can expect AI to help improve their job efficiency as opposed to taking away their jobs. I think this is, this is an important takeaway. And for them, it's it's essentially unlocking further opportunities to be closer or even clo even um, more consumer centric and enable even better experiences to their um, end consumers and and their uh, their target uh, segments. So with that, um, I want to thank you all, and we'll be sharing um, a recording of this webinar uh, as well as some other resources for uh, for you to learn about uh, Wallaroo, about Intel, about Akimera. 
and uh, Microsoft, of course, and, and all the work that we're doing in, in retail today. Thank you all for your attention, and we'll see you at Thank the next event. Thank you. Thank you.